All right, thank you very much and welcome to all the viewers. And uh, we often also nowadays have uh, viewers that are not uh, in the country. So we are always trying to broaden the discussion to accommodate you as well. So uh, apologies once again for starting a little bit late. So, but Mark is here and we are ready to kickstart the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, 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 and we're, we're just chuckling, Jesus and I, that, uh, you know, um, we are struggling with load shedding here. You have no idea about how I struggled to make this conversation happen because, you know, here in South Africa right now, we've got a load shedding. So I'm like, I'm like is Mark also in the UK having <laughs> load shedding problems? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I must admit that uh, until September last year, I was um, in South Africa and I hopefully will be back soon again. And I find the situation around this load shedding um, absolutely debilitating on every level. And I think it, it hurts um, a, a lot of businesses, a lot of small businesses that are not able to get uh, continuous electricity going through, uh, through generators and stuff. And I find it uh, very complicated. The, the strange thing is, is that whilst traveling through Africa, um, in a lot of the African countries, this is the norm. Electricity goes off all the time and sure. people have generators everywhere. I had always hoped that uh, South Africa would stay uh, away from that. And I hope now with the opportunity for third parties to provide uh, electric electricity that um, hopefully we can resolve this quickly. It should have been resolved years ago. Yeah, no, indeed. And I really have to start also moving around, just trying to make up for this conversation, but I'm happy that we are now live and we are able to chat to you. So just a little bit about ourselves. We are the entrepreneurship ecosystem company. So we hold regular conversation with industry experts, with entrepreneurs, with business leaders, just to feed a lot of inspiration and information to the entrepreneurial ecosystem to empower and capacitate small businesses to be able to understand what they need to do to inform them about uh, better decision that they can make for their business and how to take their business to the next level. So this is the much awaited and anticipated conversation that we're going to have here with Mark on the rise of e-commerce. And most of you that are here, I know that you want to know how you can take your business online and how you can trade your products and services on online platforms to reach new markets, to be able to um, advance your business into other territories as well using the power of e-commerce. But uh, to tell us more about uh, what the opportunities are around commerce and how you can do it. Uh, what's the technical process? What's the cost? And what's the strategy? So Mark is going to be unpacking all of that for us today, and uh, definitely we'll have a lot to take home and be able to go action and implement in our businesses. So Mark, there's a strange thing that we do in this show that uh, uh -huh. we don't read out the profiles of our guests. So, but we allow our guests to be able to just share with us their journey, where they started up to now, and how they transitioned. You said that you were in South Africa, you've done incredible things and incredible work here in South Africa. You moved to the UK now. So just give us a short uh, a journey uh, of, of how everything worked out to where you are from the humble beginnings, from where it all started up to where you are right now and what it really inspires you about technology and why I into, <laughs> into technology. And I should also warn our listeners that if they have questions as and when they have them, then they can be able to drop us the questions because this is a conversation and also this will uh, be featured, it, it, this video will be featured on all our social media platforms post this production that we are doing. So Mark, take it right away. How has your journey been from the humble beginning up to where you are now? <laughs> I know I'm putting yeah, you well, on the hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll start. I start when I was a baby. No, I'm I'm kidding. But I I do need to say that I am originally from Holland, and I am uh, currently in Holland. I don't know where the UK came from, but um, our, we have our organization. A part of our organization is based in the UK. Um, I am. I was born and bred in in the Netherlands, and uh, being part uh, uh, being. Um, parents my parents were in the dutch foreign service so i've been traveling to lots of countries my father unfortunately was never posted in south africa but um more or less by accident i ended up uh, coming to south africa from new york city i was based in the u.s working for deloitte uh, in those days it was called deloitte and touche 
and they sent me to South Africa um, because I had some, made some good progress with some people there. And one of the things that I learned on an early, early stage was to have a very good network. And nowadays with LinkedIn, but also in other situations, one always has to look at the network because your future depends on it. And um, your, your business essence will always rely on the fact that you have made a connection with people, you've made an impression with people, and you're being able to uh, use those, um, those links that you've created for yourself to try and um, uh, advance yourself and create a better situation for yourself. So 25 years ago, 1996, most of you weren't even born yet. Um, we uh, we uh, landed in Johannesburg at a small airport and uh, we walked out the building and straight into the car and drove into uh, into a beautiful, um, sunny South Africa, uh, arriving from Europe, from the Netherlands, where it was icy cold. And um, we started our lives there. Uh, we've had three children there. I lived in Ravonia. I've lived in four ways. Uh, I still have an apartment in four ways. The family has moved uh, back to the Netherlands to study and to work here. Um, but I can assure you, um, you know, once South Africa gets into your bloodstream, it will never leave you. I was fortunate enough to, after working for Deloitte, to go and work um, for one of the first search engines ever built uh, on the continent in Africa, if not the first, and um, it was called Anansi. Uh, Anansi is named after a uh, goddess in West Africa that was able to put people on the wrong foot. Uh, but they use it, she, it is also depicted as a spider. And because it's a spider, um, that's what you use in order to set up a search engine. You go and spider the internet, the web, and you grab the information, put it into a database. Um, when the dot boom came in the early 2000s, uh, Anansi was projected and positioned and money was poured in to try and create um, a portal, a portal that would, would, was able to um, feed South Africans with information from the internet. So we added um, through a third party with a, a white label, we created 5,000 jobs, we created a travel portal, we created all this kind of environments that were already existing on the web, but then became part of uh, Anansi. Um, Anansi also had the second largest florist in the country, the first being NetFlorist, and NetFlorist gave a version of their system and called it Anansi Florist. And so around um, Valentine's Day, we sold a lot of roses, even though we never saw any. So um, this way you can create environments by making use of other people's expertise, which is not unusual and very logical when it comes to doing business anywhere and particularly online. So, um, and I'll explain that a bit further when we go along. After that, I, uh, because of Anansi being part of, in those days, Jonic, which was also the Sunday Times, we were able to grow the base and grow a lot of users. And you must not forget that South Africa was one of the first countries and in the top five of connected people on, on the internet. Because you can jump forward, because you were able to quickly adapt and adopt uh, it was also a country where there was a massive amount of usage for cell cellular and cellular phones on the, the, the GSM network. Uh, whilst in Europe, they were still stuck with old fashioned systems that were radio based. The GSM made a massive difference. And because of security and because people wanted to be connected. And we had these companies called MTN and Vodacom. They were giving away a free phone, even though it was all based on the system that was all in there. But we, I had a brick. It was actually a cellular phone. And I can assure you, most of my friends in Europe, it took them four to five years before they had one. So there were things that were very advanced in South Africa. And you need to understand that the adoption and adaption towards internet was very high. Um, it took me five to six years to get a online version of my bank in Europe, whilst NetBank and all the other banks in South Africa, APSA, et cetera, all already had online banking. And in those days, it would take up to six to 12 months to get someone to trade online in South Africa because they had to you know, feel safe and feel that it was possible. And yet when the banks came out with their um, online versions, it was very quick and people started using it very quickly because they felt it was safe. Even though it might not have been terribly safe, 
it still works very well. And um, if you know the statistics, most of the fraud takes place in the bank and not online. Yeah. Obviously, uh, e-commerce has grown in, the, in that sense. I was part of a group that was calling itself the Online Publishing Association, which meant that all the big publishers that had an online presence were part of this organization. And we started pushing for um, regulating how many users people, unique users would come, how much the advertisers would get if they would connect or put their advertising with us. There were all kinds of systems out there that needed to be adjusted, needed to be um, uh, benchmarked so that we all were on the same, same system. In the meantime, um, Google came to town uh, and slowly, gradually, uh, Anansi started losing its space, which was very logical if you get a large player like that. And of course, because you know South Africa is predominantly, certainly online, it was all in English, uh, Google could easily jump into there. Anansi had one focus and one focus only. It would only allow um, South African content to be part of it. And um, that's what made it unique. And it ran for a good good period of time. It became part of a company called Brabies. Uh, Brabies has uh, still to this day, a massive database of businesses that you can look up. And that still, still is a very powerful tool to use. So as the internet started gradually growing, uh, you will see that people start adopting and adapting towards it. It also creates um, opportunities, opportunities for entrepreneurs, as well as people that mean evil. Um, we've had situations where I know that people sold fridges. The guys uh, showed them that they transferred the money. The fridge is gone. The money was also gone. This is not unusual. This happens everywhere. It happens in Europe a lot. And it obviously also happens in South Africa. So don't be gullible. Be clear as how you want to do the business. And if you think it, it looks too good, it probably is. So be careful with that. Um, yeah, I think that's more or less it. I've now uh, moved. I, I worked for my, my last big job was to work for a company called Cognizant. Cognizant has 300,000 people working there, of which more than half are Indian. And it was an organization that would work with large banks and companies around the world to provide them services, um, implementation of large projects based on systems like IBM, uh, Oracle, uh, and others. Um, unfortunately, that company decided to close down its offices in Africa. I still don't understand why. The <laughs> fastest growing, growing environment, the fastest growing continent, the most amount of youngsters. Unfortunately, they closed it and um, I was um, let go. And now I work for a company called DVT. We are looking for people. If you have some Java skills, you're more than welcome. Or if you know someone who has Java skills, you're more than welcome. <laughs> so DVT, that's what I work for now. And my purpose is to find IT specialists who can work within the European companies uh, from a distance, from a, from a, a what do you call it, uh, uh, remotely, uh, and be part of, uh, of teams and solutions that are needed uh, in countries like the Netherlands, uh, but also in England, France, and Germany, where there is a tremendous amount of demand for good skilled IT individuals. So that's my story in short. My children are studying now in the Netherlands. I have a daughter who just matriculated. And she uh, passed yesterday, so she's all very happy. The flag is out, well, so we're all uh, all in good spirits. Uh, and summer has finally broken up, broken in here, and it's about twenty six degrees, and it's nice and sunny. I know you guys are struggling, and it's cold in Johannesburg, um, but you know what? Um, I still miss Josie. I must say, <laughs> you know, just uh, <laughs> yeah, you being able to. We are warmly dressed with our jackets and jazz inside. Jerseys and yeah, exactly. So um, I mean, it's yeah. really, really, extremely cold. So yeah, very, very interesting journey indeed. And uh, I, I'm also just going to introduce this as who's going to be my co-host, just for the sake of the uh, viewers out there that are that are watching. So this is going to co-host, and he'll be able to pose a few questions to Mark. So Mark, Please. as you've just highlighted now uh, that you have done quite a bit of work around the e-commerce, just tell us more about what e-commerce is really about, just in layman terms for some of our viewers here. They're interested in taking their business online, they're hearing of this no. uh, e-commerce boom and, and, and that uh, this thing is exploding. 
and uh, there's a lot of opportunities for them to uh, uh, expand and really reach new markets and grow their yeah. revenues. So what is it about? What's the history? Where is it coming from? And where are we at the moment? I, I, I think that there are two categories that you need to look at. One is obviously um, the actual goods that exchange hands. So it's a physical product that you buy online and then you get delivered to your door. Um, in this street where I live, we have about four companies that deliver. And I can assure you, two out of four of those delivery people I now know by first name. So that's how many times they come, okay? Because everyone's buying online. So the pure goods that are assumed to be better priced than in the shop, you don't want to go to the shop anymore. You're working all day and you need to deliver packages. Some people drive them crazy because of course, if your neighbors are not there and they have a lot of delivery, it all ends up coming to you and they have to come pick it up in the evening. So we talk goods, goods being a physical good. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be, you know, a little stand for your, for your phone. If you can sell this product and you can ship it and it's valuable and you can still make a margin on it. Don't forget, you need to make at least 30% margin that is over above the cost of the product and the shipping, because otherwise it's no use, right? People that work with three, 4%, you're, you're gonna lose your shirt on it because you're gonna spend too much time trying to get it out. And then don't forget, if they don't like the product, they will ship it back to you. And in most cases in Europe, and I don't know how that is right now in South Africa, but shipping back is free and you get stuck with a product that you don't want. So the whole aspect of goods being sent needs to be based on incentives. Incentives of making it cheaper than, than it is in, in, in the normal shop. It needs to be an advantage to me, and it needs to be more than just having it on my doorstep. It needs to be uh, a moment that I open it, and I feel that I have received something and it's worth something to me because I have parted with my money and I need to get it in. The other category that is very under underestimated um, is of course the sale of services. So give you an example, um, a painter who is specialized in indoor painting and does a very good job and has examples that he's made pictures of, et cetera. He can promote himself, position himself online. And if he gets a lead that he can follow up and do business with, that too is considered e-commerce, okay? It is purely based on the fact that you see something, you like it, you see the references, you see that other people have actually indicated, for instance, on Google, that they've indicated they gave them five stars. If you only have three people that did it, that's not good enough. So you need to build up a, a presence and you need to build up an X amount of people that have actually received your products and has actually put up a picture or something like that. So the two categories that we're looking at is goods and services. Now under services, you also have obviously tourism. So um, if you have a, a place where you can start a and b and you can position that on a platform that already exists, like booking.com, then you can do e-commerce. Maybe people don't consider that e-commerce because you're not pulling out your credit card yet, but you know what? Goods, services are exchanging and there's money being paid. That for me is e-commerce, very simple. And don't consider the one better than the other. There are a few traps you need to look at. I am not crazy about uh, um, just uh, without too much knowledge trying to buy keywords on Google because a lot of that gets, gets misused and your money disappears and then suddenly you start putting more money in and then nothing happens and you're not getting the, the traffic. So if you're doing that, do it with a specialist, set up your network, talk to someone, see if they can help you with it. Obviously, you'll have to pay for it. You know, you're looking at a, at a margin of, of, of 10 to 20% that you need to pay for it. But if there are specialists that can do it, then let them do it or don't touch it at all. Make sure that your site, uh, your Instagram, if you're doing something in, in, a, in, a, in a positioning where you can actually show pictures, you know, start putting your channel together and start moving that forward. A lot of organizations and people feel threatened or don't, don't feel, uh, feel good at putting their stuff up. Yet, if you look at their Facebook page, they got the whole family on there. They got all their travel and all the food that they've had. There, they have no problem with it. But when it comes to business, they go, oh, that's difficult. No, it's not. You have to take a chance. You have to expose yourself a little bit. You have to build a rapport. 
you know, from that point of view, it's just like dating. I mean, Anansi Dating was one of the biggest dating companies oh, wow. in the country. Also, it was piggybacking on another system. But there, you know, you have to sell yourself, not in a bad way, in a good way. You know, you have to show a good face. You have to have a good, good story. You have to have a big smile. Otherwise, nobody's going to click on you. I'm not talking Tinder, okay? I'm not swiping left, right, center. That's not the point. But the point is you need to sell yourself. And you need to take yourself and make yourself a little bit more vulnerable to be able to do that. Then the next steps, little aspects that I think are important, position yourself correctly, buy yourself your own URL so that when people email you, it is, you know, your name at the company.co.za and not some, some Google or some, some, some email account from somewhere, Yahoo, for instance. I mean, seriously, that you, if you're in a business and you want it to be taken seriously, buy yourself a URL. It's not that difficult. You can even buy yourself a URL and use Google's backbone to do all your mails through that. That's all possible. But, you know, there are systems to do that. I myself have my own last name, .co.za, and I have my own last name, .info, and my family all uses it for their emails. So it is not that complicated. It is not difficult to do. It's just a step you need to take in order to be taken seriously. So don't concentrate on the, on the BMW. The car is not important. I don't mind if you come or never come to see me or you come to see me using a taxi. Don't start pushing your money in the wrong stuff. Cars are not important. Yeah, of course, they look good. And pick up girls, or pick up boys, whatever you want to do. I don't care. The issue is concentrate on the stuff that you think is important. And then lastly, I would like to ask every member that is listening to this, put yourself in the shoes of the other person. Put yourself in the shoes of your client. Put yourself in the shoes of the potential client. Okay, why? Because they're looking at you. Put a mirror in front of you and say, if I was standing on the outside trying to buy my product, what do I want to see? Okay, and the first thing that comes to mind is trust. Why did people use Anansi Florist? Because Anansi was a trusted brand. It was around for a long time. Why did people like to use Anansi Mail, which was a massive mail platform that was for free? Because again, they did not want to use a Yahoo. They wanted to use an Anansi.co.za domain because that was the right stuff to do. It gave you trust. So if you are a potential client, what do you want to see? You want to see trust. You want to see loyalty. You want to see service. So Indeed, if you can, oh, you're taking a picture of me? Yay! <laughs> right. um, if you want to um, um, uh, communicate quickly with your client, there is nothing wrong by saying, do you mind if we communicate on WhatsApp? If you want to be a larger company and you want to do it better, get a business account on WhatsApp. You can open it on your, on your computer and you can start answering people. If you have a business account, you can automatically answer. So, Use the tools that are there. I can assure you, I do more business on WhatsApp than on any other platform. Okay, and in the old company I used to be with, I would have four Indians and 15 clients and put them all onto WhatsApp because there I could easily communicate with everyone. It was quick, quick, quick. Hey, how are you? Super good, Mark, how are you doing? Yeah, I was late and I feel bad about that, but I'm so sorry and I'm glad I'm with you now. So, uh, and I know you try to call me and. It's unexcusable. I mean, seriously, you guys were always on time, and, and this time I really, I really blew it. So I'm sorry about that. I'll no, try. No and, I'll, I'll do the following. I will take. Um, uh, if there's anyone that needs one-on-one uh, -on -one advice, and you choose the person, then you put them in touch with me, and we'll do a, a, a session one-on-one, -on -one as a, as a not a compensation, but <laughs> more of a, you know, I, I was, I was late, and I need to be uh, slightly punished for that. <laughs> right, not a problem. I think you you're touching on very important points um, around the e-commerce boom, and I think that the, the two significant beneficiaries that um, I think our listeners would like to know is, um, you know, your delivery operators along your supply chain. You know, yeah. um, how has that uh, risen in the past few decades that you've worked for Anandi? Well, um, I found that. Um... Well, let me just take one step back. My, I had a friend of mine who actually created um, uh, NetForest. Brilliant business, okay? But it was not done because he was so crazy about flowers. Uh, 
it was done because he was they were running an internet company and they were trying to prove to their clients that e-commerce was possible. So the guy sat around the table and Mr. Blechner said to his friends, let's do flowers. They had no idea. Okay. And they made tons of mistakes. One of them being is that they piggybacked on existing florists. And these existing florists would get a fax or an email and they would say, okay, we have, we have an order for you. You need to deliver flowers at this address. This is the amount you're going to get. This is the flowers they want. The florist would work all day and in the late afternoon, whatever he had left over, he would put it in a bunch and then deliver it to the client. Client was not satisfied. Operators weren't satisfied. It didn't work. So eventually net florists started actually talking to the growers and they went to buy the flowers themselves. And they now have a full-fledged operation with all the delivery done all by themselves. And of course, is now, you know, you can get anything you want, teddy bears. Uh, um, and it's a successful business but they had to go through a massive learning curve, a learning curve that listeners and viewers of this do not have to go through. Why? Because other people have done it and you can learn from that. So if we talk about the supply chain, you need to be very careful, okay? You could say, I'm gonna sell 20 and I'm gonna have a hundred in stock, but that stock is costing you money. So you need to be careful with that. If you're suddenly thinking there's a massive amount of people coming through, and you don't have the stock, you tell them, I'm out of stock. Be honest with them, be clear with them. If you're saying to clients, um, you can get this product, but you first have to pay me and then I'm gonna buy the product and deliver it to you, maybe not. But if you're honest to them and say, this is an expensive product, and I've seen it happen. I mean, I've seen people uh, uh, offering me cameras that they didn't have themselves, but they first wanted my payment and then they would go and pick it up and drop it off with me. These are things you need to think about. So the supply chain is one. I think that there are enough good couriers that can do a good job in South Africa at a good price. I think that that, that business has matured. What astonishes me and what I really find strange is that take a lot does not deliver within 24 hours. In Europe, if you uh, order something before six o'clock in the evening, it'll be with you before nine o'clock in the morning. They can do it, so can take a lot. Yes, take a lot. It's a big country. And yes, you have a lot of stuff lying in Cape Town that you can't bring here. But then just tell the client it's not going to be one. It's going to be two days. I've had situations with take a lot. It took me five days. And then by the time I was sick and tired of it, I would go to take a lot myself and go pick it up. Because, you know, trying to get it delivered is hopeless. Right. So you need to talk to the client. You need to clearly understand the client. And that's why WhatsApp is so powerful. Because if you want to deliver to my house in my complex, you need a code. Otherwise, you can't get in. I need to send you that code. That's why it's important that that person has WhatsApp so I can send it to them. These are small things that you need to build in in order to satisfy that client. And you don't want to sell them no. You want to sell them yes. So, again, I think the courier systems are there. I think the timing is a long one. And how you organize your internal um, affairs when it comes to stocking of products, that's something that is, is, is as complicated as hell. Um, you know, the, the grocery stores, they just send people into the grocery store and they fill it up and they take it to the cash register, pay for it, and then they put it into a system and drop it off. I mean, Uber Eats is exactly that. You know, they don't have any stock. They just send the guy over. Except the problem is, over each guy goes and picks up four things and delivers four, uh, uh, four issues. By the time it comes to number three and four, it's cold. So you need to also be careful on how you do that, what you're delivering, where, at what time, and in what kind of circumstances. That's why it's also very important to ask your clients, what is the best time, the best place for me to deliver? The consequence is that you need to then come and pick it up. Right. The other one is to use uh, to use a uh, um, you know um, post the postnet or or something like that. I wouldn't use the post office. I would use postnet. All right. Right. I think with with take a lot. Um, they've really integrated integrated it with um various platforms like uh, your know, Mr. B Food as well as you know um, Korea systems so that they could just. Um, fast in the, the process 
But I think the most interesting um, second part of the, the significant um, beneficiaries, digital payments. Um, recently, uh, President Ramaphosa has just signed, um, you know, um, Cyber Crimes Act, which I think will will hinder a lot of businesses in, in the process. So I just wanted to know how crucial is data analytics when it comes to um, digital payments in, in e-commerce? I find that a difficult question. Starting off with, with um, digital payments in e-commerce, um, what um, I saw in the days that we started with e-commerce, particularly with a company called Ocor, which is a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, um, auction house is that they created an escrow system. So you would put the money into escrow, which is basically an account that they hold. And when you receive the product and you sign for it, the money would be released. That system also exists on the equivalent of Gumtree in Holland, um, which is called Marktplatz, Mar Marketplace. They're, they're actually interlinked, those two companies, and they use the same system. A lot of people want you to pay first. I think that is not a good system. I, certainly not for goods and services that are that are uh, uh, either too good to be true. I mean, I have my son as a good example. He's, he's a smart boy, but he's lost money on people offering things that were just too good to be true, and then suddenly they disappear. The phone number is no longer there. The email doesn't work, you know, uh, because they, he he trusted them that they would uh, they would deliver the goods if he would pay them. So be very careful with that and be very precise with that. So. The, the buyer as well as the seller can easily be duped out of his money. Don't trust it. Take it easy. Think it through. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And then you're in trouble. So escrow is one way to do it. Um, another way to do it. So basically the money gets released the moment the person has received it and signed for it. Of course, you still can open the box and it can still be faulty, which is still a problem. There are ways that you can be protected by law but you know what if you're buying a product for 200 rand what are you going to do you know you feel bad the guy basically took you for a ride you don't have a product that works and you paid for it and it's it's tough it's it's but you know and and you can't go back to a store because there's no one there okay so um <clears throat> i think the use of credit cards is still one way to do it because some of the credit cards are protected um but people want transfers uh, they want the money in the bank. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I do not know what the best situation would be for South Africa. I think the best way we would still be is that you do it through an escrow. So the money gets put into that account as soon as you've received the goods and you've inspected them and you say they're okay. The person on the, who's delivered it to you asks you for a signature. You have now released the money automatically into their account. I think that's the best way to do it. Um, but you can also try and get money in cash. I once sold a car in cash and there were a few notes in there that were fake, but you know what, that's part of life. Mm -hmm. At least they were not all fake, that was good. And I don't think the guy did it on purpose either. <laughs> yeah. So now since we, uh, we are now touching on the, the real importance of um, e-commerce and how small business can come in. I mean, the recent study shows that about online retail has gone up 66% from yeah. 2020. And this is from Arthur Goldstock's uh, report. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Please so, so, do mention his so, name. He's a good friend of mine, and I want to acknowledge that Arthur Goldstock yes, with Arthur MasterCard has come out. Now, Arthur Goldstock, just one second, okay? Arthur Goldstock is the guru of the internet in South Africa. In the very early days, he was already coming out with how many users there were, how many people were online, what they were doing, how many people are on, on Facebook and on all the platforms. And he's been doing this for a long time. Originally, Arthur was a journalist in the music industry and then switched over when the internet came online. Um, he's, he's been a, a very interesting and a very uh, solid uh, force to play with. And this growth of 66% is beyond us. I remember Arthur saying that he believed that maybe 2% of all the trade would be done online. He, we had no idea in the beginning days of the pioneering days of the, uh, of the end of the 90s, the end of the century, the turn of the century, what effect the internet would have. I mean, listen, we couldn't have done this conversation without the internet. Okay. I couldn't have worked from home and from far away without the internet. This is changing our lives. 
And um, so now that the epidemic has come through and it's clear that people can work from home and don't have to leave at four o'clock in the morning to be in Sandton City um, at five o'clock because otherwise they get stuck in traffic. I mean, the world is going to change. So it's clear that, that online trading, online buying, online e-commerce uh, of products and services is, is, is rapidly increasing. And uh, that's a good thing. Yes, please continue. Yeah, so that, that study shows that it has gone up by 66% from 2020, which is three times the normal average rate of 25%. That is normally the ongoing end. By 2018, it was about 14 billion, but now they are projecting that by 2021, it will have gone to 42 billion. So this is really exploding. And uh, hence we are preaching the message of small business that there's a big opportunity here, but now, what is the process of getting online? What is the technical process? How do you do, go uh, about it? What's the cost and what's the technical process? How do you list your product there? So just advise someone who say, I'm sitting with the product, COVID has shut, uh, has shut me down. I want to now take yeah. the product online to, to reach yeah. new markets, to get new online customers. So how do yeah. they go about that? Well, it's not much different from the real world. So you need an audience. And to just say, well, the audience is online is not good enough because they won't find you. You need an audience like in a mall. So um, in Holland, where I stay, there is a site called bol.com, B-O-L.com. And as a small entrepreneur, you're allowed to buy yourself a shop within that mall. And they will do the shipping and they will do it under their name. It is a great platform. I hope that uh, take a lot will do the same. I understand that Juma is, is that right? Is it Juma? What's that platform that is used throughout West and East Africa? Um, I haven't heard about, but I know that there are a lot of uh, other international platforms as well, like your- Yeah, well, uh, you know, you can always start off with, um, with Gumtree. Okay, Gumtree is a good way to find people. If you're looking for a product, there's a good chance that if you look at Gumtree, you will find it. And the nice thing about that is, is that it has all the back end systems in place. It, it gives you the, the, the user, it gives you the buyer, it gives you the seller. So if you have products that you think people are interested in, then there's nothing wrong by placing it on Gumtree. Obviously, there are uh, also people that make use of that system to, to be fraudulent. But overall, I think I have sold a massive amount of stuff through Gumtree. And there's nothing wrong with it. And most of the people are very nice and they come and pick it up and, and they pay for it and they go. So again, if you have a warehouse with, with things that you believe people want, then position it on Gumtree and see how that goes. So that people can actually say, okay, this is a place where you can find them. So not only do you need a platform to be able to do the trading on, even though I don't think that everybody needs a full-fledged e-commerce backbone and payment gateway and all that kind of stuff. If you're not selling anything, then why spend that, that kind of money? Start with Gumtree. See how that goes. If you see that there's a market for it, then build it up from there. If you see another platform where people are also trading and buying and selling products, services, then try to get in there. Try to become part of that environment. Try to become of that community because you need the eyeballs, which will not come automatically they will not just knock on your door and say, oh, hey, hi, how are you, Sipo? I'm buying from you. No, they first need to see what you have. They need to be in touch with you. Um, so I still think that it's important to find an area where you can do this. And then don't be arrogant. Don't think that your product is the best and the only product that's available in the whole wide world and everybody wants it. Take a step back, look at yourself, look at what your client's needs are, and then start putting something together that's going to work. If anybody has an example that they want to put onto the chat and they want us to walk it through or to talk it through, then please do. Um, again, uh, you need a good appearance. It needs to be a clean page that you create for yourself, like a website, which you can also promote or put onto the links that are necessary on, um, on Gumtree and people will actually see your products. One thing that report, by the way, from Arthur Goldstock does not mention is the amount of people that have found each other and done business offline or services that have been sold. This is purely goods that you're talking about, okay? Goods that have gone from A to B and money that's gone from B to A. 
And that's why I think there's a lot more available uh, and it's a much more larger market than that we actually think. So there is, there is a possibility to look for that as well. Um, do you have an example of a, of a product that you can think of? Well, I remember we were doing a lot of uh, training as well for the guys in fashion. So they design yes. clothes, they design yeah. um, um, art and craft. So uh, it's physical products that can be placed in yeah. all the pictures. Well, let's first, let's first talk about, about uh, fashion, okay? Fashion is frickle. Fashion is difficult. Fashion is, is for certain people, not for everyone. Okay, uh, the one will buy a shirt that, that, that is great. Uh, another one will buy it once, maybe not even once. They'll buy it twice, that's it. You know, you need to be very, very conscious of where your clients are and what they want to do. So you need to start promoting it. You need to start writing about it and you need to get the eyeballs in. So that means that let's say that you have a, a few beautiful suits that you want to sell and there are a beautiful African pattern uh, uh, you know, maybe even the the, the wax uh, system, uh, the, the the wax uh, uh, patterns that you that you see that are really nice, uh, the tie dyed, whatever it may be. And now you want to reach that market. You need to first find where is that market, where are the people that have the money that want to spend on it, that want to buy a product like this. That's where you need to start. So there could be a forum, there could be another area. Then obviously it would be good to have a landing page or a page where people can see the products and make a choice. And then if you are doing enough turnover, then you can put a back end with a payment gateway and uh, where people can put their details in. Obviously the payment gateway needs to be safe. You know, you need a little lock on the, where it has the URL, the WWD to have a lock so that people think that their money is safe and putting it in there. So again, that would be for there. Now, arts and crafts is a, is a very difficult one. Why? Because there's a lot of offers. There's a lot of junk out there and there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, go to the arts and craft markets anywhere, even in the middle of Rosebank. You walk down there, there's some beautiful pieces there and there's a lot of stuff that people don't want. How do you get something like that to an audience that wants it and takes it forward? Well, to be honest with you, I have a friend of mine who buys the, 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 the statues, stone statues, wooden statues in, in um, Harder Bay Sport. He puts it into a container, he ships it to the Netherlands, he puts it into a physical store here, and he sells it that way, or he sells it through the internet. Very tough to do. But at least he has the products close to his clients. That's quite important. And he has specialized stores that, that sell products and services from the third world, and the people walk in and they do a one purchase. They like the little elephant, or they like the hippo, or they like a little, little, little statue like this. Very hard to sell. Now, how do you sell something like this on the internet? <laughs> Very difficult, really difficult, but it's possible. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but I've got behind me a poster of, of Africa. Uh, it was made by a company called Amatuli. They are in, in um, they're somewhere in Joburg, have a big place. You can walk around and find anything you want from masks, from East Africa to anything. How do you put something like that online and get someone to buy this? It is very difficult <laughs> because, again, it needs to be very niched. You know, who's going to buy a poster like this? I love this thing. I mean, to me, it's, it's perfect. But it's, it's also something that you buy because you're walking into a store and you're holding it. So when you have a niche and you have something that is specific, don't start crowding your site with too much stuff. Make a separate, stuff, a separate site for something that's specific. Create something that really works and try to push that slowly, but get it to the right audience. So it's the audience and the product that needs to fit. And if you have, don't have the audience, you can put as much product as you want, it's not gonna work. If you have too much product and a little audience that is only interested in pieces of it, it also doesn't work. So you need to continuously see what that match is and how that's going to work. And don't be too optimistic, you know, be realistic. So what I'm hearing from you is that you are saying that Whoa. it's not going to be a magic that you have a product on the platform and automatically it translates into sales. And uh, most of the people, they believe that once they have products everywhere and then that does enough. So how do you then, uh, because you have, you have spoken- be Before we go there, be before we go there, before we go there, okay. Mm -hmm. I've always been amazed by the guys that sell stuff on the side of the road. Now, in Africa, 
uh, for instance, in Nigeria, you buy everything on the side of the road from, from juices to, to uh, spices, to sugar, anything. <laughs> in Africa, you only buy certain things. And every time that I drive by, <clears throat> I don't buy much from these guys. I, maybe I bought one or two small things, but normally I don't. And a lot of people say to me, but why are these people, nobody buys this stuff. Why are they there? I said, be careful. They're there because they know that people are buying stuff. Okay, They have a product that fits the market. They have the audience because the drivers are coming by and they're running after them to sell that product. So don't think that these people are standing there for nothing because if they're standing there for nothing, they would die because they wouldn't have any, anything to eat. Mm -hmm. They sell their products at 100% margin. They're very good at it. So think like a guy that's selling side of the road he's got the audience he's got the people seeing there and he's got the product that these people want that's what you need to think about so if you have a product but you have no idea where your audience is and you think that everyone's going to buy it you're going to lose out so you need to find that match that goes together yeah with that back to you then <laughs> then with the um with all of these other supporting platform to the e-commerce because for people to buy there must be a compelling uh, a, a thing that will make them buy. So it, it might have been that you have been supporting it in promoting it with other social media and yet using other platforms to promote the product so that uh, e-commerce just becomes uh, a, an, an access to the product. So how do you then use a data-driven uh, approach to ensure that you collect all the data sets that are sitting in all of these platforms to inform yourself how you can position the product better, measure the customer experience, and be able to uh, 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 rely on the on, on the science and the data to now uh, uh, do much better on, on, on online. Well, I think one of the things you need to do when you do the promotion is that you also um, work on the basis of um, analytics, analytics in this case, Google Analytics. So when you are promoting it, for instance, through a, an article or through a picture, that when that picture comes up on someone's browser, that you see the time slot, maybe through the through the uh, uh, DNS, you'll be able to see where they're coming from. Um, you're seeing how many pictures and how many pages they go through, and through that to try and analyze who those users are and why they're not immediately buying. The other thing that I find very interesting is that I, when I want to buy a product or I want to sell a product, I want to make sure that my details are on every single page. Because every time that you have to click one further to then go to a, to a contacts page and then fill in a form, you know, it's not going to work. Every time that a person has to do one extra click, you lose about 60 to 70% of the... Um, what do you call it, of the, of the audience. Why? Because they don't want to take that extra step. So if you can put a logo on your page for WhatsApp and people click on it and they immediately can put something into their phone or because a large portion of the audience uses phones to do this kind of stuff. So it needs to be visible well on the telephone. But if I have a link on there that automatically opens up your WhatsApp and sends me a message, then of course, then I'm in business. And then you need to feed, feed and follow up on that quickly because that's where your service comes in. And if you then say, fine, I'd like you to make a payment or a down payment through this, this e-commerce network, you put that link back into WhatsApp, they click on it, they put their details in and you've got your, your, your down payments that you need. For instance, it could also be that you want to only get it in cash. So the, you know, the delivery guy delivers it, he gets the cash, he comes back and gives you the cash. I cannot tell you how to run that business. The only thing I can tell you is trust is important, communication is important, and finding those details quickly. You can, we can have a long conversation about what systems are out there. And there are several, okay? And you can go for, for payment in Bitcoins, and you can go for, for uh, using uh, PayPal. They're all possible. I think that you need to step one step back and say, what do I want to achieve? How much am I going to spend time doing this? and not resolve all of it by just throwing technology at it, but start thinking about the UX, okay? The user friendliness of the information that they're getting and how quickly they can communicate with you and how quickly you can, you can grab them. 
I find that if someone comes onto your page, it feels like they're standing in the parking lot right there, okay? And if you're not walking out there to greet these people, but you want them to click three, four times before they reach a form where they need to then find, put in information and then wait until you get back to them, it's not good enough. If you've got the guy in the parking lot, you want him to immediately walk through the door and buy your product. And if you need to open the door, then open the door. That's how hungry you need to be in order to be in this kind of business because your competitor is going to do that. And before I take this as a question, uh, I would just like to also tell our viewers to post their question. And uh, if maybe if you want to be unmuted, just raise your hand, I can unmute you. Or if you want to uh, type out the question, use the chat, and then we'll be able to direct that to, to Mark. So we'll be reaching um, the close of the conversation very soon. So I don't want to leave you out. So do pose your question on the chat or if you want to be unmuted, just raise your hand and then I will unmute you and then you'll be able to talk directly to us. <laughs> so Matagulo, you can have a question. Right, so I think this is definitely gonna be my last question to you, Mark. Um, you, you will, hold on, you never have a last question for me. Every time that I try to hang out, you say, I have one more question. <laughs> you know what, I like that. I have no issue with that. And if there are people that wanna go over time a little bit, I don't have a problem with that either, okay? Because it's important that people have the moment in time that they can they can say it. This is also what you what you learn when you work with customers. You need to give them the time, you need to give them the space and not just block it off. Go ahead. Right. So within the span of your career, I mean, what are the key highlights of um, e-commerce that you have come across in, in Africa? Well, you know, I find it amazing that um, uh, the, the biggest florist in the country is an online florist. And that the second one was a site that we basically ran as a white label under Anansi. We never saw a bunch of flowers, but we also never had any complaints. And the people that bought from us would not go to Net Florist because they trusted the brand. I mean, from an e-commerce point of view, that was really awesome. And, um, you know, I, I've been to the farms where they, they, they cut the roses and bring it out for, for, uh, for Valentine's. And it's, it is absolutely incredible. So the journey has been great. Um, the adoption uh, within South Africa, particularly of the internet, was amazing. It was still uh, very much towards the upper echelons of, of, of uh, society. And I think finally now it's breaking through that everyone can use it. The uh, expansion of, of, of the use of the mobile. I mean, I'm talking to you now on my mobile because I think it's a lot. The camera is a better quality than the iPad and the, Air, the, the Mac Air that I have here. So... And I could do this from clear across the other side of the world. I mean, there is there is nothing stopping us. And and now with COVID, the advantage that we now have within my company to be able to take South Africans and put them uh, to work in in a in a in a Dutch company that um, um, they will probably never come to visit, but are able to stay in their own houses and do the work uh, diligently and and to, to perfection. I am just very very excited about that. Is that e-commerce? Maybe not. Uh, you know, I'm not selling a product. I'm not an entrepreneur like you are, and I'm jealous of that because I don't, I don't, I don't have that. I'm a guy that works within a corporation and does some entrepreneurial stuff. But the real entrepreneurs—that's you guys. You guys are the guys that take a product, that take the risk, that want the reward, and get the reward if it all works out. And if you don't, then you learn and you start over again. I'm a guy that that uh, that wants to work within a larger organization. And maybe not take the risk. I don't come from a family that that, that does this. My father was a was a, a civil servant. His father was a, was a lawyer. I mean that we're not we're not entrepreneurs. It is you guys that make that difference. You guys are hungry. You want to take that risk, and I've got great respect for that. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> no, it actually does um, answer answer the question because you have touched on. Um, a very important aspect, which is mobile um, devices, yeah. that uh, in in Africa, that's basically what um, most of the users use to connect to all these e-commerce platforms. Yeah, um, one of the largest platforms in Holland I spoke to this week, and they say that up to ninety percent is now uh, mobile. My daughter um, watches Netflix and does everything on her mobile. She never even sees a television anymore. Why should she? And she has a laptop, but it's been closed for weeks because you know she's done her exams and why would she use the laptop anymore? 
Um, I do a lot of my my writing and reading and stuff that I need on my on my phone. It drives me nuts, but you know and this uh, and, and it's affordable. You know, if you buy a simple phone that just has a bit of internet connectivity, you're online and you you can open up the world. What do you need a computer for? So where do you see the trends in maybe five to ten years in in terms of the e-commerce? Because as you are saying that, the let me tell you one thing. Is... Let me tell you one thing. Yeah. Every person that now says the trend in five years will be X. Sure. I think it will be X to the third degree. Okay? <laughs> it is going to go so much faster, so much bigger, so much. I mean, IoT, if you look at a mine, a mine needs rollers, right? To bring the stuff up. These rollers will now have IoT. How? Well, because they're putting Wi-Fi in the mine. Why are they putting Wi-Fi in the mine? Because if you have a roller that's not rolling correctly, then and the next time when you need to fix it, or when, you, when you're down, when you do your repairs, you can take that one out and put a new one in. It costs an absolute fortune if it breaks while you're, you're, you're producing, because then you have to take your 500 miners that are down in the ground. You need to take them up because you, can, you cannot operate. So everything that we touch, everything that we do is going to have an internet connection. Right. That is not all for the good, but it's going to make our lives a hell of a lot easier. I mean, most of the new cars that you see nowadays, BMWs, they have a massive amount of data. Here comes the data again uh, that they gather of the car and they send it through to Munich. And there's 600 guys there that do nothing else than data, data uh, restoration. Why? Because they want to know more about that client than just the car. They want to know whether this person treats the car correctly, what they do with it. Once you have that data, you can then say to a person, you don't have to buy the car anymore. Why don't you lease it for me? Okay. And in four years time, you give me back the car. You have nothing to pay. The only thing you pay for is the fixed amount every month and you pay uh, for the gasoline. I'll take care of your tires. I'll take care of everything. You think that's new? You think that's novel? It's exactly the car that's standing outside here at the house. Okay. It is a lease car. But all the information, all the data every day goes back to BMW. So what's it going to be in 10 years' time? We have no idea how good it's going to be and what we're going to do. The one thing I do hope is that our privacy and, and all those kinds of aspects are well under control and that there's no massive amount of abuse. You never know. It might be possible. But we will start working within environments, and, and particularly here in the West where people don't buy cars anymore, but they, the one day they want a bicycle, the other day they want a moped, the next day they want to take the train, then they want to take the plane. And all this will be one system. The, the railway station in Holland has a bicycle, has a car that you can, you can borrow, you pay for it, of course. You can take the train, you can buy an airplane ticket, you can, uh, uh, someone can, can maybe bring you on a wheelchair and take you somewhere. All of this is possible in one, under one roof because this is what people are looking for. They want one system that does it all. So you can take the bus, you can take the train, you can take the tram. So all of this is becoming one, one system with one card. And that card is going to disappear and it's just going to come off your iPhone or whatever, Android phone. So I can't tell you what it's going to be. I mean, we're not going to go grocery shopping anymore. We don't. Um, give me one more example. You can order groceries and have it sent to your house. But wouldn't it be great if you could choose five meals a week and they would bring it in a box to you, nicely packed in five packets. And you take one packet out and you're going to have that meal today. Or you want the other one, you take the other one out. You choose which one you want to start with. It comes with a piece of paper and tells you exactly how in 35 minutes you can make an excellent meal. Not only that, but it's it's very fresh, very nice, and very tasty. Wouldn't that be nice if you have two people working at the house and you have a child in the house? It would be brilliant. Well, guess what? That's what I get every week. Every Tuesday, the man knocks on the door. There's a big box. There's all the packets of food in there. And he gives me what I want for that week. And we eat from that system five days a week. We've been doing that for 22 weeks. We love it because the taste is great. It's got everything in it. Everything you need is, is there. You have a menu. They tell you how to make it. And it's delicious. It's fresh. It's healthy. It can be vegan. It can be fish. It can be meat. Whatever you want. And you never have leftovers. So 
it becomes more and more important for people to get that kind of stuff. And then the next step, of course, is, is how do I make sure that the food that I eat or the, the, the things that I'm doing, that they're uh, carbon, uh, what is it? Um, carbon neutral. Because we don't want to uh, uh, kill our planet. And people are interested in that. Also, people want to know that if a, uh, I got flies in my house. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> if you uh, uh, receive oranges and they come from South Africa, I want to know who that farmer is and what he's doing. That too, you can do. You can put a QR code on it. I can take my phone, take a QR code. And here is, uh, um, I don't know, a guy in the Eastern Cape telling me, this is the product that I made and I'm proud of it. And this is my family. And you have helped us today. Sure. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's really powerful. Um, yeah, not to keep you waiting too long, just uh, okay. I don't see a, a hand or a question, but maybe the last one for me, uh, Mark, just give, um, in your closing comment, just um, a message of support to the entrepreneurs uh, who want to go online, or who want to move their bills online, um, just encourage them about the opportunities of doing so and to what they can expect. And um, yeah, just, just give a message of support to our entrepreneurs who really like to move online, but they don't know uh, to what extent there's an opportunity and to what extent their business can really thrive online and experience yep. this explosion that you know big and small business are experiencing online. Yeah, I, I think first of all, don't give up. Second of all, um, don't listen to all the advice. Make up your own mind. Okay, don't let yourself be pushed by by people that know it all or that have done it all, or every TED TED discussion that you can find. I can find anything I want online to encourage you or to discourage you. Listen to yourself, listen to your, your, your gut. Do you feel that this is something that you're willing to put uh, in an online environment with a certain amount of risk? Measure that risk. Yeah, don't oversell yourself, don't overbuy yourself, don't over technologize yourself. Just create something that works for you, okay? And then build it up slowly. Don't expect miracles the next day, work on it. Keep at it. Don't walk away from it. Keep that same strategy. If you want to change the strategy, fine. Make a new strategy, adjust it. Don't throw it all out and start all over again. But sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you do have to start, start looking at it again. Build up a network. Ask people around you. Ask friends. Ask your parents. Ask anyone. Listen to them. Show them what you're doing. If they're saying, I can't find it, your UX is not good, okay? Make it simple. Make it easy for people to connect with you and to contact you. When you do talk to them, talk to them nicely. If you don't know how to talk, find someone who can do the talk. If you're better at, at writing a, a, a WhatsApp, write nicely. Don't make shortcuts, do it nicely. Because people are willing to talk to you and do business with you if they are treated the way they want to be treated. So again, the most important stuff is Put yourself in the shoes of the, of the buyer and try to make it happy. You know, give it a smile. Make it, you know, if you have, if you have an emoji that you want to send in, in, in WhatsApp, send it to them. If you say you're my first client, tell them. Why not? Sure. You know, if you did something wrong, tell them. Sorry, I did a presentation. It didn't come out right. I did it. My first presentation, I'm over 50. I've done presentations my whole life. And I did a presentation to this one company. And I said, you know what? I made a mess of goof of it. And I told everyone in my company, I didn't do it. I didn't do it well. I got recognition for the fact that I at least said that I didn't do it well. So being an entrepreneur is something to be proud of. I admire people that are entrepreneurs. I do. I'm not a major entrepreneur myself, and I'm not planning to start my own business. So no. So I, I really admire it. And it, I don't care if you're selling flowers or you know, you're fixing someone's garden or you're selling, a, I don't know, a bicycle or a bicycle ride. I don't care. You're an entrepreneur, you're taking a risk and that is admirable. But then also listen to yourself, listen to the people around you, build up a network and put yourself in the shoes of your buyer. All right, no, thank you so much, Mark. What a very nice way to end it. And uh, very, very- Thank you. Appreciate it for 
all the great insights. So also to our viewers, so you had Mark in the beginning to say that if you really need a one-on-one -on -one as part of the <laughs> so yeah. management that he said, so uh, get in touch with us and then we'll be able to link you up with Mark and then we'll have that uh, conversation, of course. So thank you so much. So also this video will be posted online. So it will be on our YouTube channel, Rabela Mutumi uh, YouTube channel. So you can also find more other content there regarding technology, entrepreneurship, leadership, and otherwise. So thank you so much. And we are hoping to see uh, more of you in these interactions that we now almost have them every week. So stay in touch on our platform to hear more about when is the next session coming and we'll be very, very pleased to have you join us. So thank you so much to all our viewers. Thank you, Motogol, also for co-hosting. And then thank you, Mark, also for accepting our invitation and uh, much, much appreciate. And I believe that entrepreneurs have really found value and a lot of actions, a lot of notes and a lot of uh, implementation to do in our businesses. Send my love to Mzanzi and uh, please take care of yourselves. Be good all in South Africa. I miss you and I hope to see you soon. And for the person that is coming through, I'll promise I will do my best. And if I ever get invited back, you know where to find me. I would love to be part of any conversation or discussion that takes place. And I wish you well with your platform and all your uh, viewers and listeners. Um, have a wonderful day and have a lovely weekend and take care of yourselves.